Hello and welcome, this is Mouse Gunner, and I'm finally going to be bringing a game to my channel that I've been wanting to cover in a series for quite some time. That is MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries, which is a massive standalone expansion to MechWarrior 4, which is part of the MechWarrior series of games produced by Microsoft Game Studios, which is based upon the Battletech universe, which yeah, Battletech is a tabletop game that's been around for quite some time. It's actually still around if you want to look it up. Uh, but in any case, Battletech is a strategy game, whereas MechWarrior is more a simulation game where you play as a pilot of a mech rather than uh, commanding a, a number of mechs uh, strategy-wise on a hex grid turn-based. This is very much real-time simulation. And it's got a lot of the complexity that you would expect out of a simulation game. Now, the MechWarrior series hasn't been around for quite some time, and MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries is, in my opinion, the last best of the MechWarrior games. It was produced in 2002, and unfortunately, just like a lot of other licenses that Microsoft had that they were producing PC games for, it was more or less shelved as Microsoft made the transition into console games. There was an attempt to make an Xbox game that really didn't succeed, so they just shelved the MechWarrior series of games, and we haven't really seen anything outside of MechWarrior Online more recently delve into the MechWarrior uh, gameplay. In any case... Getting into MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries, what it is, is, as I said, a massive expansion of MechWarrior 4. Now, traditionally, MechWarrior games were story-based, very linear. For instance, MechWarrior 4 took place in the FedCom Civil War, which is an event that happens in the Battletech universe, as is Mercenaries. But with MechWarrior 4, it's a very linear path. You play as a character, and you go through the storyline very linearly. Mercenaries is very different, and we'll show that once we get into the campaign, but first I have to set up my character. So I'm going to go into roster. I did set up a character initially because it more or less makes you do that when you first launch the game, and I just called it Test. So we're going to start a new character. And we have a, diff a few different sponsors to choose from. So more or less, we're going to have our own mercenary company that I am going to command, but I have four choices of sponsor and the sponsor I choose is going to affect some things with my company. So if we just look at this description, it gives you a little bit of background, but if you look at the very end of this description, it tells you that I will I can expect more than average starting money and early access to powerful laws tech weapons. So that is a benefit of joining the Grey Death Legion or at least being sponsored by them. I can join Northwind Highlanders, and I can expect a higher rate of pay than average for all missions they complete. Wolfster Grooms, we have a start with clan level technology and, greater, and have greater access to purchasing additional clan tech. And then we have the Kelhounds, finally. And they can expect better than average starting equipment and early access to clan technology. So a couple of these have bon benefits towards clans. And then we have the Grey Death Legion, which has a benefit towards laws tech and a little bit extra starting money. And then the Northwind Highlanders, which just make more money on average than the others. From my experience, having played this game, the Highlanders start with, I think, the worst selection of mechs, whereas some of the other... Sponsors will give you a little bit better starting mechs. Now, I don't remember as far as the the background which mech is better for which kind of playthrough, but I'm going to play this as what I'd call a White Knight playthrough. I'm going to try and play the Goody Two Shoes uh, campaign path. There is more than one ending in this game, and there are branching paths that you can go down with the missions and and how you get to those ends and. There is flavor text behind each of these different sponsors, and I think a couple of sponsors more or less tell you early on which side they prefer to back, but considering that I'm the one commanding the mercenary company, it's really my choice to make, and which sponsor I choose really isn't going to impact that outside of that little bit of flavor you get when you pick your sponsor. So I haven't really decided on which of these guys I want to start with. I consider the Highlanders to be kind of your, you know, you're not really picking one way or another. There's no real set advantage. You're not going down the clan path. You're not going down the laws tech path. 
I think I'm going to go with either the Kellhounds or the Wolves da Dragoons. I want to play again White Knight Path, so I want to go the the good path, and I honestly don't remember. Uh, we're more than likely going to be supporting Davion because if I remember they're more or less picked to be the good guys in this conflict. I I think the Dragoons are favoring them, but I may not be remembering that correctly. I, I really, I, I can't remember if it's the Kellhounds or the Wolf's Dragoons that are pro Davian, but we'll go Wolf's Dragoons and we'll just go from there. And then we have my pilot name, which I'm going to put in Mouse Gunner because that is my name. And then my company name, I'm going to just call it White Knight Inc. And that's going to be our mercenary company. And difficulty regular, that's fine with me. And we'll hop right into things. So we're going to start. And now we're going to jump into the campaign, which is the, really the meat Welcome to the of this whole Center, thing. Commander. All right, I skipped ahead a little bit as there is a voice acted tutorial that starts when you first open a campaign. And I didn't want you guys to have to sit through it. So I just went ahead and stopped the recording and resumed it when it was completed. And the scope of this video is to go over the mechanics and setup of a mission before going into a mission. So if you want to see gameplay in this video, you're not going to really see it. I would recommend skipping ahead to the next video, which I will be posting these videos on a daily basis from here on out. But the reason I'm doing that is because I understand this being close to a 15 year old game, there's a good possibility that anyone watching this video has either never played the game Whereas no familiarity with it at all. So I'm going to go into a decent amount of depth so you guys can follow along with me as I progress through the campaign. So as we start on the main menu of the command center, we have two items. News and stats. News items will pop up as we progress through the campaign. We actually do go through time in the campaign starting January 1st of 3066. And as we go, time will progress. We also see account information. We So we start with four and a half million and we have a per cycle expense. So a cycle is more or less a week if you want to think about it that way. And this is our cycle expense I, again i don't know if it's a week or a month but i just assume it's a week so every week we're going to have this much expense to maintain our mercenary company we also have a rating that's going to give us an indicator of how good of a company we have based off of our equipment so right now we're at f which is a pretty low rating i think it actually goes much lower well lower than this so we're not as low as we can go but we're pretty darn low if we open up the stats, we can see there are some personal stats like mech kills, company stats, mech kills, and so on, salvage, uh, salvage, and just a bunch of different stats that we will accumulate as we go through missions. We also have a more in-depth unit strength number to give us more of an indicator of how good our company is. And then we have these unit stats. The unit stats are going to be an element of the branching campaign. As I explained, there is a branching campaign path and there is more than one ending. And how you progress through the path is determined a lot by these stats. So you have four stats, Nobility, Infamy, Steiner, and Davian. And Nobility and Infamy are opposed to each other and Steiner and Davian are opposed to each other. So Nobility and Infamy is probably a little bit more self-explanatory. So Nobility, you're doing more noble acts and Infamy, you're doing more infamous acts. And as you accumulate these things, they will determine whether or not you get missions. So the same thing with Steiner and Davian. Now the Steiner and Davian thing, probably not as, as obvious, but just to explain in the universe, we're currently in what's called the Fedcom Civil War. This is a war between the houses of Steiner and Davian within the Fedcom Alliance. And depending on which side we are uh, have the highest points in, that's more or less the side that we're going to see more missions from. So again, to explain this pretty simply, as we do more noble things, we do missions that uh, give us nobility, it will in turn snowball into us getting more missions that are noble nobility oriented. As we do more infamous acts, we will get more infamous based missions. The same thing with Steiner and Davian. As we do more Steiner supporting missions, we will get more Steiner missions. As we do more Davian supporting missions, we will get more Davian missions. And there will be a point where more or less a point of no return. If we support Davian too much, and we don't support uh, Steiner, we'll just get Davian missions. So we'll kind of branch that way. 
And that's more or less how the paths work. It, this this might be s seemingly simple, but it gets a little bit more complex as you, as you get into the missions, especially as sometimes you don't really necessarily know where you're going to benefit. You don't know if you're doing a noble or an infamous mission. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. And uh, again, Steiner or Davian, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. In the early stages of the game, it's not particularly obvious, but in the early stages of the game, it's not gonna really shove you one way or the other. It's not more until the mid game that you start making a conscious, conscious choice on which path you wanna take as far as supporting one house over the other. And I will point out, I don't want to really spoil this, but you don't necessarily have to choose one over the other. There is an end that kind of goes that way. So, uh, again, it's not just two branches. It's a little bit more complex than that. All right, with that being said, let's go ahead and go into the mech lab and take a look at mechs. So, because I chose the Wolf's Dragoons, we got a set number of mechs. These are the mechs that we start with, and it's actually a fair number. So we start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mechs overall. And we'll, sh we'll see exactly how you can use the mechs, but maximum wise, as far as this game's concerned, you can only use eight mechs, but not every mission will allow you to use all uh, eight mechs. Uh, it depends on the mission. Early stage, we're only going to start with a single lance, which consists of four mechs. So that's going to be our first baseline. And then the name of the mech is going to determine what type of mech it is. So right now we have a cougar mech selected. If we select a flea, you'll see that that is definitely a different mech than the one we had previously selected. If we go over the stats over here, we have an indicator of firepower, armor, speed, and heat efficiency. Now, most of these are probably self-explanatory. Firepower is more or less how much damage you can do. Armor is how much damage you can contend with before you are destroyed. Speed is how fast you are. Heat efficiency efficiency takes a little bit more explaining every weapon will produce heat as you use it and your heat efficiency is how well you can 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 contend with that so with this mech it having a full green bar you're not really going to have to worry about heat if we go to a different mech let's say we go with the cougar here we see it's a little less heat efficient as you have less and less heat efficiency and you can go all the way down here you're going to have problems with heat. As you have uh, too much heat, one of the end results that you can have, at least with this game, it doesn't go in as in-depth as the Battletech uh, tabletop game. With the Battletech tabletop game, there's a lot more consequences for having high heat. But with this game, the main consequence of high, having high heat, outside of having your systems go a little wonky, is that you will shut down. Your, your mech will just cease functioning for a period of time until it cools down enough that it will start up again. This is obviously very bad as you are completely and totally defenseless and uh, stationary during your shutdown. So you want to avoid this if you can. Uh, but if, if you want to dish out a lot of firepower, sometimes you have to trade your heat efficiency. And that's the main thing you're trading. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the Cougar, which is probably the best mech that we have available to us. The fleas are really kind of crap if you if you didn't already you know, notice that by the firepower number. But we can look at a couple other stats to kind of determine some things. So max tonnage, 20. So this mech is 20 tons, which is as light of a mech as you can possibly have in the Battletech universe, normally speaking. The Cougar, on the other hand, is 35 tons, so you can see it's heavier. Now, usually speaking, lighter mechs are going to be faster, heavier mechs are going to be slower, but with the way that this game plays, usually speaking, heavier mechs are just flat out better. There are exceptions to that, but for the most part, heavier mechs are better. And the Battletech tabletop game, it's a little bit better balanced so that light mechs have more of a chance. This game, I would argue, not so much. So heavy, being heavy in firepower or heavy in tonnage is usually better than being fast. Just straight up. The other mech that we have available to us is the Uller, which is not really that much worse, but you notice it is a slightly lighter. And the speed, we're going to also get an indicator here of, of kilometers per hour. So if you're not really sure what this bar means, we get more of a defined stat here. Because sometimes the bar, it, it's not really telling you the true top speed of a mech. It's more or less telling you how fast that mech is in relation to how fast it can be. So just as an example, 
The Cougar here is not too far different as far as that speed bar goes, but you'll note that it's at 96 kilometers an hour as opposed to, I think it was, what, 126, somewhere around there. And the flea is 131. I mean, maybe the bar is indicating that, maybe it's not, but we do get a more defined stat here. In any case, let's go ahead and take a look at the customization of our mech, the Cougar. So going through, uh, there's a lot of systems here. And as I said, this is a more complex game. It is aimed more at, at, at being a simulation than a more casual game. So we have some items here. So we have a be Beagle Active Probe. This we can either have or not have, and this would weigh one ton. So if we remove it, we'll see max tonnage is 35. Current tonnage goes down to 34, and we have one available ton. So this is how you can kind of tweak your mech to allow yourself to have more equipment on there. So what does the Beagle, Beagle Active Probe do? Okay, so it just says, uh, generally attached to scout or fire support mechs, the Beagle Active Probe increases sensor range and decreases missile lock time. So what that means is if we have a missile weapon that r uses a lock-on, our lock-on time is reduced. So this is good if you have a missile-based mech, which this more than likely is. We'll take a look at the weapons here in a second. We have jump jets. This is a mobility-based system. In the Battletech tabletop game, this is actually pretty useful. In my opinion, in uh, the Mech Warrior games, this is almost entirely useless. More or less, what you do is you use jump jets to jump up in the air. And as far as, uh, from what I remember, jump jets, you're not really all that maneuverable in the air. So that's why I consider it to be not all that useful. You can use it in some circumstances where you, you jump. If you're behind a hill, you jump over the crest of the hill, fire, and then come back down behind the hill but that's really a, a tricky tactic to pull off and usually aiming your weapons while you're jumping in the air is not particularly easy so usually speaking i remove jump jets i, I don't find them all that useful so we're just going to get uh, a couple tons by removing that straight out as much as i would love to demonstrate how jump jets work i just i honestly don't think they're that great we have some other systems we could take instead. Uh, we have a laser anti-missile system. This is probably pretty self-explanatory, but it, it shoots down some of the missiles that are coming in at you. So if I were to have that, it would give us a little bit more defense against missile systems. And then we have enhanced optics. What this is going to do is you do have a zoom in feature uh, with your visuals. But normally speaking, when I zoom in, it's just a little tiny box. With enhanced optics, this is going to make that little tiny box much bigger. So it's a lot easier to uh, fire at range. Probably not something we're going to want to take unless we have a lot of long-range weapons to take advantage of that. We have heat sinks. This is going to allow us to manage our heat. So as we get more heat, heat sinks, our heat efficiency is going to go up. That's pretty self-explanatory. Speed, as we add in points, it will make us faster. As we decrease points, it will make us slower. Again, not too difficult to figure out. Weapons. All right, so this is our current weapon loadout. We have weapons in various locations. The locations matter in a couple different uh, ways. The main way is the location is tied to a location on your mech. So as your, your mech takes damage in that location, you can lose weapon systems in that location. And the way this works, probably bringing up the armor grids a little bit easier so you can see. These are the dip different parts of our mech. So we have... We have, well, we can go through the list. We have head, which is listed as a one here. And then we have right arm, left arm, right torso, center torso, left torso, and so on. And usually how this works is if you lose all of the armor and all of the internal structure of a component, you lose that component. So if, if that happened with my arm, my arm would be blown off. And as you go, you will go inward. So for instance, if my right torso were blown off, my right arm would go as well. If you lose your center torso, mech's down. If you lose your head, mech's down. You have also uh, rear armor, which uh, obviously is hit when uh, someone's behind you. And then you have your legs. If you lose one leg, this is going to limit your mobility heavily. If you lose both legs, you're down. So the main ways you can die, both legs gone, center torso gone, head gone. That's how you destroy a mech. 
You can lose arms and you can lose uh, right and left torso. That's not going to stop your mech, although it will destroy the systems that are currently in that location. So that's where that comes in play. But the main thing that we have to look at is the fact that we can fit things into slots. So we have open slots, and I can kind of show this a little bit better if I remove the current weapon that's in here. So if we just drag and drop this over here, we'll remove it, and we can see what the slot looks like. So this slot is a two slot. And sometimes slots are contiguous, sometimes they're not. If we remove our, our weapon over here, and I am remembering what these are, and I can always cancel a... A choice if I don't like it. We can see that these two slots are contiguous, but this slot here is not contiguous with this slot. So I cannot put a three slot item, although I don't have a three slot item, I cannot put a three slot item in here as far as I remember. We could probably confirm that by drawing this out. Oop, if it'll let me draw it out. There we go. And then if we do this, it shouldn't work. Yeah, see, it doesn't work. I have to use the contiguous slots to get that to work. And the color of the slot determines what type of weapon you can put in there. So red slot, red, uh, red weapon. Green slot, green weapon. Gray slot, anything. So this is a, what is considered an omni slot. I can fit any weapon type in here. Now, you'll note that I have this clan LBX AC-10. It's a two-slot weapon. Well, I don't have any two-slot omni or yellow slots so i cannot put this anywhere because this over here is a red slot just like the slot over here so i cannot put that weapon in there so it is mech dependent upon whether or not you can put a weapon system in there this is quite a bit different than the way the BattleTech tabletop game works where uh the the building mechanics are much more in depth this has been simplified quite a bit but if we put the weapon system back in there that was in there, we can see what our normal loadout is. So we have two tons available. So that means I could add in two tons worth of equipment. Or I could put it in other things, which I, I probably am going to end up putting in an armor because we're not very survival right now with our armor. But just going over what weapon systems we have, we have clan long range missiles, uh, the LRM 10s. So we have two of those, one in each of our, our side torsos, so right torso, left torso. And then in our right arm, we have a uh, clan extended range, large, uh, extra, extended range, large laser. And then over here, we have extended range, small laser, extended range, uh, medium laser, laser, and again, clan. And if you see the little C in the corner, that ex means that it is a clan weapon. There are two types of weapons. There are standard weapons, which are considered inner sphere weapons, and then there are clan weapons. Clan weapons are more or less an upgrade, and the clan element of things is, is part of the game universe. The clans are a, for lack of a better term, uh, nation uh, 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 unto themselves, and then the inner sphere is a separate nation. I'm putting that in quotes because that's not really uh, technically true, but it, it explains things a little bit better. So the clan tends to be a little bit more technologically advanced, so their weapons are a little bit more advanced as a result, and a little bit better. And this was an advantage of being in the Wolf's Dragoons, is that we got clan tech and clan mechs. This is a clan mech here. So we get, can take advantage of that. At least I think it is a clan mech, from what I remember. In any case, this is our current loadout. I'm probably not going to change it too much, because we really don't have any weapons in the kitty too much to change. We could, for instance, take out these... Uh, how much do they weigh? They weigh three and a half tons. So for instance, I could take out both of these and they each weigh three and a half tons. That would be seven tons. And then I could put in a clan uh, LRM 20 that would weigh six tons. I'd save myself a ton, more or less. And honestly, that might even be a better deal because if we take a look at this, range 1,000, that should be the same. Damage is eight versus 16. So we can see double the damage. Heat is 2.4. Heat is 3.6. Recycle time is the same. So just going over those stats, range, that's self-explanatory. Damage, that's self-explanatory. Heat, I kind of already explained. This is how much heat you're going to uh, build up as you use a weapon. And then recycle time is just how long it takes in between firings, how long it takes to fire each time. So you're going to fire, and then there's going to be a duration of time that it takes for the weapon to rearm, and then you're going to fire it again. So the cycle rate determines how fast that happens. So from what I'm seeing right off the bat... If we were to remove both of these clan LRM-10s and upgrade to a clan LRM-20, 
we'd save ourselves a ton and have a weapon system that does the same damage but less heat because multiplying this heat number by two you can see that that would do more heat so this is actually more efficient for us and this is kind of a part of the game of figuring out what is the most efficient setup that you can do i can also set up uh this is a, a weapon that uses ammo so i can put some tonnage into bringing up my ammo supply or i can keep it as it is and energy weapons don't have an ammo supply, so you'll note there is no box here, so they more or less have infinite ammo. And if we go over other weapons, we have a large laser, so this has range 800, not quite as long ranged. It does uh, 7.5 damage, not quite as much damage. Heat, quite a lot. Energy weapons tend to, uh, to produce more heat than anything else, but they also tend to be more efficient as far as tonnage goes. So we see the tonnage of this weapon is, is 4, which is not that bad considering what kind of weapon it is. Uh, you really see that with medium lasers so this tonnage is only one it is much less range as, as a matter of fact it's half the range 800 versus 400 it does 2.5 uh, i'm sorry 2.45 damage versus 7.5 uh 7.5 yes but if we do the math and we multiply this by four we can see this would do more damage it's more efficient uh, granted you have to be close enough to be able to use it uh, and also maybe not as efficient on heat, but still you get an idea energy weapons can be more efficient as far as weight the Usually least uh, efficient as far as weight tonnage goes is uh, ballistic weapons, which are the yellow weapons uh, green weapons tend to be kind of in the middle But yellow weapons definitely uh, Are pretty heavy, but they don't usually generate that much heat as you can see with this weapon. It only generates one heat Usually speaking, the way this works is lighter mechs take have better advantages with energy weapons because they're they're weight efficient, whereas heavier mechs have some advantages using ballistic weapons because they are heat efficient because they have more tonnage to fit a lot of weapons on. So you don't want to overwhelm them with too many uh, heat inducing weapons and have them shut down. So ballistic weapons can be a way of of getting around that. All right, well, in any case, I kind of explained how the weapons work, and I, I feel like I have upgraded this uh, particular mech with the LRMs. So let's uh, jump into some upgrades we can do. So we have armor uh, here, and we have our max armor is more or less indicated by this bar. So you can see that we're a ways away from our max armor with this mech. We also have different armor types. We have uh, the standard armor, at least as far as this game is concerned, which is the Pharaoh Fibrous. And then we have reactive and reflective. Reactive and reflective combat a, a particular damage type. Reflective is combating energy weapons. Reactive is uh, combating ammunition type weapons. So that's going to consider be ballistic weapons and missile weapons. So you're kind of choosing one over the other. Uh, these also, I believe... I, I think you get more bang for your buck as far as the uh, the armor. I don't really remember that 100%. But I think I'm going to stick with uh, standard armor for now. We can just hit this max armor button. And get an amount of armor that would fill us fully up. Now we do have kind of a fractional amount of tonnage left over. That is not really that helpful. Usually you want round numbers. We probably could speed ourselves up. Oh no, see it wouldn't even let us do that. Yeah, so we can't even speed ourselves up with how much tonnage we have. So we could back this off a little bit to give ourselves capability somewhere else. Maybe even just one point in one location or uh, would do it maybe to speed ourselves up. So maybe we remove some rear armor here. And if we take a look at our speed, no, that's not quite enough. We could remove our Beagle Active Pro, but we do have an advantage with that because we do have a lock-on weapon, which is going to be the LRM. I don't know if that's indicated here, but I can tell you flat out, LRMs have a lock-on. So we're definitely advantage with that Beagle Active Pro. I don't necessarily have anything to spend that tonnage on, though. So I think I'm probably just going to take the Max Armor, but in the future, we can move some things around uh, to use this uh, tonnage a little bit more effectively. So we're using it in, uh, completely rather than having a little bit left over. But once we're done... We can save, but we do have a couple things that we may want to do before we do that. First off, we can change our paint scheme. So we've got all of these listed here, and this is just your own choice. So I know that I'm going to go to a planet that has kind of a snowy landscape coming up. So I might want to do something that gives me 
camouflage for that. It doesn't really necessarily matter, but you can choose a paint scheme that you kind of like. So maybe I use this one and this is what I stick with or I, I change it up depending on what the environment is. I'm trying to remember what a lot of these look like. And then you have some that are just like a little silly. Uh, I'm trying to remember. We've got Racing Stripe and Power Pink, Bright Pink there. Well, because we're going to be the White Knight, I figure, why don't we uh, paint ourselves white? I believe there was one that did that snowball. There we go. That's kind of white. There we go. So that's going to be our paint scheme, and it will uh, work, I think, for the next mission anyway. And then another thing that we can do is we can set up our groups, and this is going to be kind of important. We're going to want to set up our groups so that weapons are in groups and in ways that we want them to be. So our shorter range weapons I'm putting in weapon group one. Weapon group two is going to be our... Actually, no, I did that wrong. There we go. So weapon group two is going to be our large laser, and then weapon group three is going to be our longest range weapon, the LRM-20. So that's kind of how I've divided it. And you can do even more div uh, divisions than that if you want, but just to keep it simple, I'm just going to do three weapon systems. And I'm going to hit OK, and we have saved our mechs. Uh, actually, yeah, now we have it saved. And I can go ahead and go through all of the other mechs that I have and make those changes. More than likely, I'm going to be running with the, the Cougars and the Ullers. So I'm just going to remove the Jump Jets. I don't think AI use them anyway. And then maxing out armor as much as I can. Uh, I'm not going to change the weapon layout really here because I don't really have the equipment, in my opinion, to change that. And we'll just stick with that. And then over with the Uller. Oh, I do want to save that. Yes. And I'm fine with the weapon group as is. So we'll just save that. And then... Oh, we didn't change the paint scheme of that. We want to keep our, our mechs all the same. We can do that. And then we switch over to our Uller. And we do the same thing. And... ECM. So what this is going to do is a defensive unit added to a mech sensor system. It decreases enemy sensor range, increases enemy missile lock-on time. So this is kind of the opposite of the Beagle Active Probe. And there are some options that are grayed out. Some mechs just can't take a system, whether, whether you want it or not. All right, and then we don't really have, I think, too much to change here. I'm probably going to uh, keep the default systems and not move them around too much, at least in the scope of this video. And we're fine with the basic weapon loadout. And then our last Uller here, we're going to also paint with the same scheme and save it. And that's pretty much all we're going to change for now. We can make more changes later if we want to, but that's more or less how the mech labs work. And we can go to the free market. This is where we can buy di different things. We can buy pilots. So right now we only have three pilots plus uh, myself, which is four pilots. We can only use four mechs at this point, so there's no real reason to buy another pilot. But if we want to, this is where we can buy them over here. And then we also have chassis that we can buy so we can buy more mechs what mechs we're going to have available to us is going to change as we go throughout the game so right now we're mostly stuck with medium and light mechs so we've got this mech here the chimera which is a medium mech of 40 tons the way that the uh the, the universe works is if it's 35 tons and lighter it's a light mech and then it goes 40 to 55 is a medium 60 to i believe 75 is heavy and then 80 up to 100 is assault and that's as big as a mech can be uh which is you know five times the weight as of this little flea guy here and then outside of the mechs that we start with the cougar the flea and the uller we also have a puma that we can uh, get and a wolfhound so these are the mechs that are currently available to us to buy and they cost the amount of money we see here we only have a balance of four and a half million so it's not going to be uh easy for us to afford any of these mechs and then we also have weapon systems that we can also buy. And again, cost is listed here. And as you can see, things are pretty expensive. So we don't have a lot of ability to buy too many things at the moment. But there is advantages uh, uh, into completing missions in that you do salvage weapons and mechs in, uh, once the mission is done. So you can get weapon systems and, and mechs through that and not actually have to spend any money 
if that's the route you want to take. And then finally, we have the star system map. This is where we're going to be going to the different mission zones. So this is our map of the inner sphere and we have the different houses. So this is Davian over here, the yellow space. And we have Steiner over here, which is the blue space. And then the clans are these little fingers that are, are jutting in here. Just to give you some ideas of what the inner sphere, uh, where things are located. So we have two missions. We have Eden and we have Halloran 5. So, I am going to be jumping to Halloran 5, as I think this is the best planet to start on. But we can also see here what, what missions are available to us if we were to jump to that planet. So we see two missions. The threat level is how hard of a mission it's going to be, so it's light. How much we're going to make as far as payment. Who the employer is. Uh, the alignment is neutral. This can be deceiving, though. Uh, as sometimes it will give you points towards one house or the over the other, even if it is neutral. But if it was a true Davian mission, that would say Davian here, or it would say Steiner if it was a Steiner mission, so on. Heat sink efficiency. This gives you an idea of the planet surface, what kind of heat sink efficiency you're going to expect. This is a cooler planet, so we get a little bit extra heat sink efficiency. If we could jump over to the Eaton, we see reduced heat sink efficiency because this is a desert planet. So these are pretty much two extremes here. So I'm going to jump to Halloran 5 just because I consider the missions a better starting point. I think they're a little bit easier and you can build up to it. So we just hit jump to jump there. We do have a cost for system jump and that's going to be this many C bills, 125,000. And we also have how many weeks for the jump. And as I said, cycle cost, more or less every cycle is a week. So we have one week that will pass as we do that jump. Whenever you jump to Outreach, which is more or less your home base, I believe your cost to jump there is zero. I may be misremembering that, but... From what I remember, Outreach, uh, you can more or less jump to for free whenever you choose. And the distance away is going to determine how expensive it is to jump and how many weeks it will take. So Eaton's further away, so it's going to take us longer to jump there and cost us more to do so. So we're going to go ahead and jump. Hit OK. We're going to have a cinematic that... Uh, shows us jumping over there, and now we're on the orbital view. So if I jump back over into the command center, we can get to that by clicking on the orbital view. And these are going to be the missions that we have available to us. So we have uh, two missions on Halloran 5. We have offshore and checkpoint. And when we uh, click on any particular one of these missions, or just hover over it actually, we're going to get a, a description of what the mission is, and, and so on. But I think we're going to jump into that in the next video. I think this is a good point to go ahead and put a cut in the video. So I hope I have explained things uh, pretty thoroughly for you guys. In any case, I hope you guys have enjoyed. This is Mouse Gunner, signing out.